Welcome to the 2023 USPTO Veterans Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program. My name is Ed Carbayo. I'm a U.S. Army veteran, and I work as an innovation outreach specialist for national programs here at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Today's program will introduce you to a leader in the field of trademarks, brands, and logos. We will discuss how to protect yourself, your idea, or your small business while distinguishing your brand from competitors. We will also discuss the process of how to trademark your product or service in order to protect your intellectual property while maximizing your potential success. We will also hear from a respected leader in the military resource community. Their mission is to empower and assist current service members, veterans, and military spouses by delivering technical assistance, resources, and programs specifically designed to help start or grow a small business. Don't miss a candid discussion with three veteran innovators as they share how their military service prepared them for their entrepreneurial journeys and hear why they all chose to protect their IP. Finally, we will explore some of the resources available here at USPTO to help you identify your potential intellectual property and connect with resources who can help you protect your IP. Before we begin, I would like to address a few details regarding today's program. If you miss any portion of today's program, don't worry, we've got your six. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on USPTO's YouTube channel. We would like to remind you that during today's program, we will be accepting questions via email at veteransinnovation at uspto.gov. We will do our best to address each of your questions as time allows. If for any reason you become disconnected, simply log back into the program at any time using the previously provided link. Now, to begin the program, I have the distinct honor and privilege of introducing Ms. Doreen Mathias, Chief Learning Officer and Enterprise Training Officer at USPTO and a U.S. Army veteran. Welcome, Ms. Mathias. Hi, I'm Doreen Mathias, Chief Learning Officer for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and a proud U.S. Army retiree. It's my honor and privilege to welcome you to the 2023 Veterans Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program. This incredible program offers opportunities for anyone in the military ecosystem, including independent inventors, entrepreneurs, and small business owners, to connect and learn about programs and resources that can help you start and grow your business while protecting your intellectual property. The USPTO values military veteran experience, as evidenced by the nearly 1,300 veterans hired here since 2012. That's roughly 10% of our entire workforce. Although I retired from the Army in 2015, I firmly believe in the soldier for life concept, carrying so many of those skills, methods, qualities, and values of military service with me into my service as a government employee. I say service because that commitment to bringing our best self to whatever we do in the interest of the greater good is one of the most significant hallmarks of a military veteran. I say skills, methods, qualities, and values because those represent the intangible ways veterans demonstrate that commitment of service to others. Among the most widely recognized transferable military skills are leadership, problem solving, teamwork, integrity, adaptability, responsibility, and effective communication. All of these support my further service to the nation through developing the employees of the USPTO. As military veterans and on inventors and entrepreneurs, I know you apply the same when you bring to life your ideas, products, and processes for the ultimate benefit of others. As a participant in the Veterans Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program, you'll have the opportunity to learn from former military service members who are now accomplished inventors, innovators, and entrepreneurs as they share their experiences and lessons learned along their entrepreneurial journeys. And you'll have the opportunity to discover valuable resources that can help turn your passions into profits by starting or growing your business. You'll also hear why it is so critical to protect your intellectual property and what can happen if you don't. Thank you for participating in this important program 
and for continuing your commitment of service to the nation by empowering yourself through increased knowledge and knowledge sharing about how protecting your new ideas and investments in innovation and creativity helps strengthen the vitality of the U.S. economy and the world. Enjoy the program. Thank you, Ms. Mathias, for your service to our country and for your thoughtful remarks on behalf of USPTO leadership. We are now going to hear from Congresswoman Cheryl, a U.S. Navy veteran and representative for New Jersey's 11th District. Welcome, Congresswoman Cheryl. Hi, everyone. This is Congresswoman Mikey Cheryl. Thank you to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office for hosting today's Veterans Innovation Entrepreneurship Program and for inviting me to speak with you all. Each year around Veterans Day, we take time to stop and recognize our veterans and their families for the sacrifices they have made for our nation. But as I know each and every one of you knows, it's not enough to spend one day year thanking our veterans. We have to ensure that they and their families are set up for success. And that's exactly what you are doing here today. By listening to and learning from veterans or entrepreneurs, I hope that all of the participants today are able to walk away with new ideas and have some of your questions answered. I know that the VIE program has some incredible resources and I encourage each and every one of you to take full advantage of them. In Congress, I'm focused on creating job training and employment opportunities for veterans, as well as service members transitioning to civilian life. So thank you all, have a great day today, and I really appreciate all the support. Thank you, Representative Cheryl, for your service to our country and for your thoughtful remarks on behalf of the United States Congress. At this time, I have the distinct honor and privilege of introducing our first guest. Jason Lott is the Managing Attorney for Trademarks Customer Outreach here at the USPTO. Jason specializes in helping innovators and small business owners understand the importance of trademarks, the federal trademark registration process, and the available resources here at USPTO to help innovators and entrepreneurs protect their IP while setting themselves apart from the competition. Jason, the floor is yours. Hey there, everybody. My name is Jason Lott. I'm the managing attorney for Trademarks Customer Outreach at the USPTO, and it is my job to teach you about trademarks. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So I'm going to teach you what they are, why they're important, and how the federal registration of your trademark can help you build your business. So. This is what we're gonna kind of talk through today, all right? We have <laughs> a condensed session. Uh, so I am going to move pretty quickly. Uh, I do wanna talk to you. I do wanna answer your questions, but if you don't mind holding on to your questions until the end, because I know, looking around the room, because I've met uh, a good number of you over the past couple of days, you're gonna have plenty of questions and we won't get through the presentation, okay? Uh, so, so if you could, hold on to your questions. And, and actually, one of the things I usually find is that folks are so smart, they are one slide ahead of me. And so they ask the question and I go, boop, and there's the answer. Okay, uh, so this is kind of what we're gonna hit today. We're gonna talk through what in the world a trademark actually is. We're gonna talk about why you might wanna consider registering it with the USPTO. We'll talk very briefly about filing and registration. And unfortunately, not because it's so simple, uh, but because it can be complex and we obviously don't have time today to go through it. Um, but we've already been kind of thinking about maybe things we could talk about next year. Uh, so if people come back to MIC next year, we might have more in-depth trademark programming. Um, I'm not saying that we're gonna do that, but if you could let the organizers of MIC know, <laughs> that would be great. Okay. And then of course, we want to talk through some uh, uh, talk through some uh, resources that are available to you. Uh, we have lots of great stuff available on the website, amongst other things. So I want to make sure that you know what they are and where to find them, so you can access them. All right, so let's jump in, <clears throat> and please excuse my voice. I've been talking a lot the last couple of days. Uh, let's talk through what a trademark actually is. Okay, so let me ask you this question. Uh, if you look up in the top left-hand corner there and you see the Apple logo, what product or service do you immediately think of? I heard phones. I heard computers. I heard tablets. Earbuds. Streaming services. All of it, right? So every single time you see that Apple trademark, 
boom, it automatically calls to mind a very specific set of goods and services. Coca-Cola, what product do you think of? Soda. McDonald's? What'd you say, heart attack, what'd you say? Oh, diarrhea, oh my goodness. What McDonald's are you going to? Okay, uh, I'm not going there. Okay, uh, Microsoft, what do you think of? Computers, Samsung. Phones, Amazon. Everything, right? And get it in two days, or maybe two hours, depending on where you live. All right, Google, what do you think of? Nike. Ford. Yes, right? So every single time you see or hear or experience this trademark, it automatically calls to mind this very specific set of goods and, ser and services. That relationship between the trademark itself and the underlying, is that my timer? Oh my goodness, you guys. <laughs> this half hour has gone fast. Uh, so the relationship between the trademark itself and the underlying good and service is key. Without that relationship between those things, it is not a trademark. Okay, it's always, always, always tied to specific goods and services. We'll dig in a little bit deeper as we go. So that's one thing I want you to take away from this. Here's the other thing I want you to take away. When you look up and see all of these brand names and logos and things like that, do you ever see these companies use these in black and white? No. You don't, right? But this is how they registered them with our office. And they did so for a very specific reason, and it's a reason that you too can take advantage of when you are filing your application, right? We're gonna talk about that in just a couple of minutes, but I want you to be aware that this is available to everybody. Doesn't matter who you are, okay? You don't have to be a big company to take advantage of it. You can take advantage of it now, even if you haven't even started your business. Leslie, I'm looking at you, Leslie. Right, even if you haven't started your business yet, Leslie, you can too can take advantage of this if you happen to file, okay? Okay, cool. So here's the uh, thing about it. Uh, so with regard to the specifics of a trademark legally, it's something that identifies the source of goods and services and it distinguishes those goods and services from those of another party, right? So the easy way to think about it is you go to a restaurant, here at Resorts World, and you say, um, I would love a Coke to the waiter. And the waiter says, maybe not here at Resorts World, but says, is a Pepsi okay? Right? We often hear that when you go to restaurants. I don't know <laughs> which uh, soda company actually uh, is here at Resorts World, but, uh, right? but anyway, uh, you ask that question. And what you see in action right there is you using the Coca-Cola trademark to ask for the product you want, the waiter using the Pepsi-Cola trademark to indicate the source of the goods they provide, both of those companies using their trademarks to distinguish themselves from their competitors. That's what you, as a business, also need to be doing. You need to have something that is gonna distinguish you from your competitors. So when they walk into a store and they say, yeah, you guys got, uh, rah, 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 right? They're using your trademark and not your competitors, right? Same thing if they're searching uh, on, on, online, right? you want them to use your trademark as that search term so they can find it, okay? The bottom thing there, what, it really, what we're really talking about is legal protection for your brand. Now, marketing people will often talk about your brand. What's your brand? What's your brand, man? I mean, like, when people like see you, like, what do they think of, right? That's really kind of what a brand is. It's like, how does someone feel when they experience your trademark, right? Maybe you are someone who likes a Coca-Cola and you get that feeling of nostalgia, oh yeah. I remember dad and I cracking open a Coke, you know what I mean, at the fishing hole, and you know, whatever it is, right? You know, they, they play into that. Like, so what is the thing when they experience your brand? Is it energy? Is it, um, is it fierceness? It, what is it, right? How do you protect that feeling that cre is created by your brand name, your slogan, your logo? How do you protect that? The answer is a trademark, okay? If you're following along, the answer is a trademark, okay? And specifically, the registration of that trademark. So let's talk about what a trademark does not do. Uh, okay, so somebody reformatted my slides. It's okay. Uh, so what a, tra a trademark does not mean that you legally own a word or a phrase, okay? It does not mean that you can stop other people from saying that word or that phrase, and it does not mean that people owe you money 
okay, if they, uh, if, if they say that word or that phrase. I've heard that before. Jason, if I uh, trademark this, that means anytime someone says that they owe me a nickel. No, that is not true. That is not what that means, all right? So we often think about this. People think about trademarking something, right? Hey, I came up with a cool slogan, uh, trademark. <laughs> okay, that's not a thing, okay? You can't just like spit out some cool slogan and be like, trademark, I own it. Okay, that's not how it works, all right? So what we're talking about with a, a trademark is actually the exclusive right to use something to indicate source. Quick example, Apple, common everyday word. Apple Inc. has federally registered the word Apple as a brand name for smartphones. Does that mean that they legally own the word Apple? No, right? Can they stop you from saying the word Apple? No. Do you owe them money when you say the word Apple? No. But if you invent a new smartphone, would you be able to call it an Apple phone? No, you would not, right? So think about this when you're thinking about your trademark. You know, we talk to people all the time and they talk about, oh, I came up with this cool thing. I want to protect it and own it. Yeah, you can own the trademark, but you don't own the word, right? You don't own the phrase necessarily. So if you want to get um, super technical about it, uh, a trademark indicates the source of products and a service mark indicates the source of services. But seriously, don't worry about it. You will see both of these, use, these words often used interchangeably. You can just call it a trademark. You can call it a mark, and that's totally fine. Sorry, a little bit of my accent comes through when I say that. <laughs> my wife makes fun of me all the time because my best friend from growing up is named Mark. And she's like, how many vowels are in the word Mark? <laughs> I'm like, his name's Mark? Uh, what is that? Right, so you'll hear me say that throughout today. Uh, but, but you can just call it a mark, and that's, and that's totally fine, right? Don't feel like you have to get trapped into, is it a trademark? Is it a service mark? Doesn't really matter. Okay, so these are the most common types of trademarks that we often think about when we think about trademarks. Brand names, slogans, and logos, okay? Most of you, when you probably, if you stopped by the table today, might have had, or the past couple days, had in your head one of these things, a brand name, a slogan, a logo. Uh, maybe you have all three, maybe you have more than that. But these are the most uh, traditional sorts of things that we're talking about. So what you see in the bottom left-hand corner there is an example of a brand name. This is obviously a very well-known brand name, Coca-Cola. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you ever see Coca-Cola use their trademark in Times New Roman font? No. It's usually in Spencerian uh, cursive font. They've been using it that way for over 100 years, right? This is how they registered their trademark with our office. And again, they did it this way for a very specific reason, and it's one that you two can take advantage of. I'm gonna, I, you're going to go home in a trademark today, I'll tell you that. Okay, so, so the, what this is called is called registering your trademark in what's called a standard character format. Standard character, because the, it's, it's not like fanciness, right? It's like the characters that you can punch in on your keyboard. That's what we're talking about, standard character. And when you register your trademark in standard character format, that means that over the life of the trademark registration, you can use it in whatever font style, size, color you want to, and we're not going to say anything to you. All right? Because in order to register your trademark with us, you are going to have to give us evidence of how you're actually using your trademark in commerce. And we're going to compare, what did you put in your application? And what do we see in this photograph that you just gave us? Right? So if you have it, you're using it in some particular way, and you give us uh, a photograph that shows how you're using it, but then a couple years later, you're like, you know what? Comic Sans isn't as cool as I thought it was. I want to put it in a different font. Right? We're going to, hey, you registered in Comic Sans. We're going to look for it in Comic Sans. Right? But if you register your trademark, in standard character format, we don't care what font it is in, all right? So what you're getting here is this expanded scope of protection for your trademark. All right, now to be clear, what I just said is not legal advice, okay? I did not give you legal advice, I'm not allowed to, okay? So what I said, not legal advice. However, I can tell you that in all my years of working with small business owners, this is what most of them do once they have the knowledge. They register it in standard character format because they're getting this expanded scope of protection for the wording itself, not for what it looks like. Same thing is true if you want to protect it for a slogan. You know, it's the real thing, always Coca-Cola, open happiness. 
just do it, I'm loving it, mm -mm -mm -mm, good, what, whatever it is, right? All those sorts of things, they are protectable as trademarks, right? And you can protect just the wording alone, but you would submit it in that standard character format. Now, how many of you in here have like a brand name that you kind of have in mind or something that you've maybe been using? Yeah? Let me ask you this question. Before you came in here today, if you thought you were gonna protect your trademark, how did you think you would protect that wording? Would you just submit it in whatever font it's in? Probably. Anybody gonna do something different when they submit their application? Yeah, look at you, Mike, first one up. Yeah, that's right. Okay, right, so something for you to consider, not legal advice. Okay, what, how many people in here are thinking about a logo? Oh yeah, more hands, more hands, okay. How many of you, and I know I was talking to somebody earlier today about this, how many of you uh, have like a full color version of your logo? Yeah, I see you, Cheryl. Yeah, right? Oh, everyone's like, I don't want to raise my hand too high because I think he's going to call on me. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not going to call on you, but maybe I will. Okay, so here's the deal. All of you who think you have to submit this full color version of your logo, you do not. You could be like Coca-Cola and submit your logo in black and white. Because remember how I said you're gonna have to submit evidence of how you're using your trademark? If you submit that full color version in your application, we're always gonna be looking for that full color version on your evidence. So, later on down the line, maybe you don't wanna use it in brown and yellow. Maybe you wanna put it in purple and pink and green and orange, right? We're gonna say, whoa, 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 hold on a second here. Hold on a second. It's supposed to be in yellow and brown, but we're seeing over here in these other colors. But if you submit your logo in black and white, we're not gonna ask that question. We're gonna say, cool, looks great. Moving right along, okay? So what you're getting here is expanded scope of protection and flexibility for your mark as it grows and changes over the years, right? If you think about what if Coca-Cola, the only thing they'd ever submitted was their cursive thing in red, right, or in white. Well, we're always gonna be looking for that. Now, Coca-Cola's been using it that way for 100 years, so it wouldn't be a problem for them, but maybe your business is gonna change, right? Maybe your logo is gonna tweak a little bit. Maybe you're gonna use different colors, right? Because, you know, I don't know, burnt avocado is no longer the color that everyone wants, okay? So, registering and applying to register your trademark in black and white is one way to give yourself an expanded scope of protection. Good? Yes? Okay, great. Uh, love it. All right. Again, not legal advice. Okay. Here's the thing too, folks. So pretty much anything can be a trademark so long as it indicates the source of specific goods and services. Let me show you what I mean. It could be something like a sound. Now my voice is shot, but you might recognize bum, bum, bum. NBC. That's what it's supposed to be, okay? We hear those NBC chimes, boom, you automatically think radio and TV broadcasting. Right? Those of you who are old enough to, begin, to remember the beginning of the internet, you might remember Yahoo had Yahoo, right? You know, like registered trademark, okay? You hear something, you automatically think of that particular company, right? These sound marks are incredibly powerful. It could be something like a color. No joke, it could be this. All right, man, my slide is really messed up. Sorry about that. Okay, cool. Don't worry about uh, all the wording down there in the bottom. Uh, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, all right, so the thing you see in the bottom left-hand corner there is that brick-looking thing. Have you ever in your life seen pink fiberglass insulation? Yes, you folks are looking at a federally registered trademark. That's right, Owens Corning registered the color pink when used with fiberglass insulation. You see that insulation, you know it's Owens Corning. Anyone in this room been lucky enough to receive jewelry in a robin's egg blue box? Yes, all right, raise those hands up high. You're like, yes, I have. I'm actually wearing it now, all right? You folks were looking at a federally registered trademark of Tiffany's. Have you ever looked out the window and seen a brown panel truck and somebody hops out in their brown uniform? Did I shut that off? Okay, good, Whew. oh my goodness. I shut it down, that's right, that's right. So you see that person in that brown uniform and it, in that uniform, you are of course looking at UPS, right? Now, let me ask you this question. Does it mean that UPS owns the color? 
No, of course they don't own that particular color, but they have the exclusive right to put it on their trucks, right? And on their uniforms. And when you see that person in their, you know, their top and their shorty short shorts, right? And their tube socks, you're like, yeah, that's the UPS. My, my neighbor back home used to call him the ups man, you know? So, yeah. all right, so you would see, yes. So then is it okay? Yes, great question. So the question is, they have the exclusive right to use the color brown for their things. They only have the exclusive right to use it or to indicate the source of their parcel delivery services and whatever else they have identified in their application, right? So they don't own the color brown outright. You might be able to use the color brown in, I don't know, whatever, we, whatever business it happens to you be in, you happen to be in, so long as it's not like parcel delivery and transportation and delivery service, that sort of stuff, yeah. See, now you've opened the door and there's another question. <laughs> Oh, the word under the brick is hologram. Uh, hologram, that's right. The thing in the center there, that's upper deck. So, you know, it's a trading card. You might have it on like an Am your Amex card or something like that. So a hologram can also, when you see it, indicate source. The one that you can see there, configuration shape, that's obviously the one here on the right-hand side. What company is this? Coca-Cola, that's exactly right. You know, look, you don't even have to see the brand name. You automatically know boom, that's a Coca-Cola. I mean, think about the power of that. You walk into the convenience store, he's in the refrigerator, yep, there's a Coke right over there, right? You automatically know it. And look, this has been around for over 100 years. It was about 1916 uh, when they first introduced the contour bottle, and the reason they did it, because there were a bunch of counterfeiters that were knocking off Coca-Cola back in the early years of bottling. So they asked their bottlers to come up with a distinctive sort of package. And so they put it out, and a bunch of different bottlers all came up with different designs. This one is the one they went with, their contour bottle shape, and they've been using it ever since. Right? So you too could also have something like this. All right? Now, I'm not saying that you have to at all. I'm just saying think creatively about what you are using to communicate with your customers. Is there a particular color palette or combination of colors that you happen to use? If there is, that might be something that you could protect through a federal trademark registration. When people see that green and yellow on agricultural equipment, they automatically think John Deere, right? You can take advantage of that as well, right? It's, again, not just for big guys. It's, it's for everybody. Anything we're going to talk about today, doesn't matter who you are, you can access it, right? Which is a lot of the work that we do is making sure that everybody knows they have access to these sorts of things, okay? All right, so I haven't broken it. Good. All right. So real quick knowledge check here. Does a federally registered trademark mean that you own a word or phrase? No. no. Exactly right. Uh, do you have to use your business name as your trademark? We haven't talked about this, so you might want to think about it. Do you have to use your business name as your trademark? No. Oh, my goodness. You guys are amazing. You are exactly right. You do not. Your business name is just what you register with your state in order to do business there. Your trademark is what your customers see. It's what you use to get their attention so when they see it, they automatically think of you and the amazing product that you provide. Perhaps it's some sort of flavored popcorn. <laughs> oh, look at these bags I see throughout here. I'm looking at you, combat corn. Okay, right? So I, I don't know what your business name is. Uh, maybe it's combat corn. Ink. I don't know, uh, but I don't know what it is, right? But it's going to be something that automatically, when you see it, you automatically know who it is, all right? So don't get trapped into thinking it has to be your business name, all right? Okay, cool. I'm going to keep moving here, and hopefully I don't uh, <laughs> black out the, uh, the PowerPoint. Okay, so in the United States, there are multiple ways of creating trademark rights. We're going to talk about two, okay? One of them is common law, and the other is federal registration. So common law trademark rights are created as soon as you begin to use something to indicate the source of your goods and services, all right? There are a lot of you in here who probably already are building up common law trademark rights in your trademark and didn't even know it, right? This is the beautiful thing about trademark rights, right? In the United States, they're based on use. That's not true in other countries. In other countries, it might be, who's the first to run down to the intellectual property office? Not here. Here we say, in order to have rights, you must be using your trademark. So the issue, as you can see there in that second sub-bullet, is that they're going to be limited to the geographic area in which you are operating. For those of you who are online, eh, doesn't really matter, right? You're reaching everywhere. But maybe you're someone who has a small business, maybe Combat Corn. The only place that they show up is at a farmer's market. 
um, here in Las Vegas or something like that, right? They're not on social media. They're, they're not doing any advertising anywhere. Their rights would really just be in this small area. And that's fine for those of you who want to have a small business, you know, just in your hometown or whatever it is. That's okay. You could go your entire business life and never, ever, ever register with our office. You could always depend upon your common law trademark rights. And you could, if you wanted to, use a little TM next to your trademark or a little SM if you want to get fancy and you're providing services. You could do it right now. Those of you with computers in front of you and have your website up, some of you are probably like, TM, <laughs> right? <laughs> right now, you could do that, right? There's nobody you have to ask permission from to put a TM next to your trademark. There's no particular font, style, size, color that you have to use. Uh, oftentimes people put it on the right-hand side in either a superscript, maybe in a subscript. It's really up to you. The thing you're not allowed to do is use the R in a circle. That's reserved for folks who have registered with us, okay? So if you do register with us, if you do wanna have um, those nationwide rights, um, you might want to consider federal trademark registration. All right, so these rights are created when you register with us. By the way, I see everybody, uh, a lot of you taking photos and stuff like that. The slides are available uh, in the Hoova or Hova app, depending on how you uh, pronounce it. Deepak, is that correct? Correct. So you can you can get the slides uh, through the app. All right. So if you don't if you don't don't feel like you have to <laughs> screenshot the entire time. Uh, so. Just, I just want you to be able to focus on what you want to focus on and not have to worry about documenting what you see in front of you. Okay, so it's created, these rights are created when you register with us. It creates this legal presumption that you are the owner of the mark and that you have the right to use it throughout the entire United States and its territories. No longer are your rights limited to a geographic area in which you're operating. Now you are protected across the United States. And let me also point out, it is creating a legal presumption that you're the owner. That's not necessarily true under common law. You would have to prove that you're the owner of this trademark and to have the right to use it. Not so, here you got a document and you say, hey judge, check this out, right? This is prima facie evidence. I'm the owner of this trademark and I have the right to use it. It's on the other guy now for him to prove that he should have rights in this trademark. That's huge. You are shifting the burden off of you and onto your competitor or whoever it might be that is perhaps infringing on your trademark rights. You also see there you're putting the public on constructive notice that you're the owner of the trademark. You can bring legal action concerning the trademark in federal court. Not true under common law. There you'd be suing in state court. Is that my timer? No, I mean, you're close, though. It's probably close to the top hour. So, okay. Uh, the, here's another thing I want to point out. Okay, this is one of these little-known rights that a lot of people don't know about. Anybody here um, operating or going to be operating in an industry where there's a lot of counterfeiting going on, could be clothing, apparel, software, yeah, you know, in your printing business and stuff like that, uh, could be um, automobile parts, uh, wine, <laughs> personal protective equipment, whatever it is, there's all sorts of counterfeit stuff that's coming in the country. If this is you, what you could do with your federal registration is go to, electronically, go to U.S. Customs and Border Protection and say, hey, CBP, I want to record my registration with you. And so that means the CBP agents are gonna have your reg, and they're the ones who are gonna be out of the ports and borders trying to enforce your rights kind of on your behalf. They're the ones who are gonna crack open the container and pull out those counterfeit Nikes or counterfeit combat corn, whatever it is that's coming into the country, right? And they're gonna stop that stuff from coming in and undercutting you and your business. I mean, think about it. As you're starting your business, how, how tight that line is right, to get for profitability. If all of a sudden you're losing 5, 10, 15, 100, 200, 300 customers at how much ever, you know what I mean? Your analysis changes. You can stop that from happening, or at least try, by recording your registration with CBP. Not a lot of people know it, so I always try to highlight it whenever I can. You can have people working for you, right? Have the federal government working more for you, okay? Uh, so you can also use your uh, filing as a Application or registration is a basis for filing in another country. Trademark rights are territorial, right? You get rights in the US. That doesn't mean you have rights in Canada. If you want rights in Canada, you file in Canada. You want them in Mexico, you file in Mexico. Now, with this, you're still gonna be having to file applications and pay money and things like that, but this is supposed to be an easier way for you to extend protection from the United States into other countries in which you are operating. Let me also say, Yes, um, 
you can use your application or registration in the US um, through the, the Madrid protocol to try and extend your protection from here into specific other countries in which you might be operating. And it might also be, you're not technically operating there, you're not selling there, you might just be contracting with a manufacturer in another country, and uh, the folks in that country might say, hey, that's a pretty cool trademark. And in their country, it's not based on use, and they run down to the intellectual property office, and they register your trademark in their country, and guess who will not be able to operate there using that trademark? Right? So there is a lot of value in thinking about not only where are you going to be taking your product or service, but is it something that might be manufactured there? And you're going to want to try and protect yourself there in advance if you can. Okay? Uh, real quick, uh, you no longer have to use the TM or the SM, and instead you're going to swap it out for the R in the circle. Okay? All right, great. Real quick, are you required to register your trademark with our office? No, you are not. That's right. You could go your entire business life and never do it. And here's the deal. The great thing about it is it is giving you choice, giving you flexibility, because it's not a requirement. That means when you're filling out the form, you have more options, like standard character format or black and white special form format, OK? Does registering your trademark with the USPTO give you international protection? No, it does not. Awesome. You guys are four for four. That's pretty great. OK, so real quick, I know we're, oh, 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 I got 26 seconds before I want to start answering questions. So I'm going to fly through this bit about filing and registration, OK? So this is kind of what the process looks like. <laughs> this is really simplified. It's obviously more complex than this. But think about it this way. You file. It comes to our office. We examine. That's the yellow phase. There's this weird little thing called publication. And then it moves on, hopefully, to registration. Now, it's obviously more complex, but that's kind of how it works, all right? The issue is not where, oh, uh, Jason, I paid this money. Where's my certificate? That's not how it works, right? Every application is examined. And again, it doesn't matter if you're a big time person, if you're just starting out. It's going to get examined by a trademark examining attorney. That's a job that I had when I started. Christina, my colleague right there in the middle, wave your hand. Yep, she had when she started. All right, th that's what we did. We looked at your applications and helped to determine whether you could use that R in the circle symbol. All right, so if you decide to file, um, you'll be using our uh, trademark electronic application system. Um, as you can see there, uh, if you want to know prices, <clears throat> the standard filing fee is 350 bucks per international class. I'll talk about that in a second. But as you can see, there's T's Plus, which is 250 That's right. It's cheaper, right? We are trying to uh, incentivize you to use the T's Plus version of the form. And that is because what is happening is you are front-loading your application with everything so the examining attorney doesn't have to chase you down, right? She's like, hey, Cheryl, where's the thing? Like, you're supposed to turn in the thing. Where's the thing? What's going on here, right? Nope, it's already in there. And that means the examining attorney can go, check, check, check. Great, let me move you on. Right? So this is a way to try and help your application move faster. We want to encourage you to do that. That's why it's $100 cheaper than our standard fee. Real quick, in terms of international class, I'll try and move fast because I want to get to questions. Uh, and, and as all goods and services are, are divided up into 45 different classes. They're called international because we have international agreements and with other countries. Right? But think about it, like paint goes in one. Uh, class. Chemicals go in another. Metal goods go in another. Hand tools in another. Clothing goes in another. Sporting goods go in another. Popcorn goes into another. Okay? Right? So they're all divided up. So when you apply to register with us, you have to tell us what are your goods and services. Okay? And so your goods and services, it'll get, we'll say, oh, it's in this particular class, and therefore, based upon that, we determine your filing fee. That's the quick way through it, okay? It can be a little confusing, and I know that I'm moving fast. So if you want to ask me questions about it, I will answer them. <laughs> OK. Uh, so in terms of what goes in your application, we need to know which version of your trademark you want to file with us, standard character or black and white special form. OK? Uh, we, you have to tell us what those goods and services are. You have to tell us what the basis is. The basis could be, hey, guys, I'm already using my trademark in interstate commerce. And we say, great. Or it could be, I'm not using it yet, but I have a bona fide intent to do so within the next three to four years. That's right. If you have not started your business yet, but you're working on it, 
you're taking those steps, like maybe you're getting your business plan together, maybe you're working on financing, maybe you're work, working with folks at the VBOC or an SBDC or a WBC or SCORE or name your acronym, okay? Uh, it could be any of those things. As you're getting your business together, that's okay. You can go ahead and file with our office. And oftentimes small business owners do this because they wanna be the first one in the door. Because let's say you have some super cool trademark and you're worried that your competitors are gonna be like, oh my goodness, that's so awesome, I wanna use that trademark, right? You're worried about somebody trying to steal your trademark. Well, if you are the first one in the door, that means competitors, if they try to file something that is similar to yours, theirs is gonna get suspended and ultimately is probably gonna be refused because you were first, okay? So uh, oftentimes people ask, hey, can I go ahead and file even though I'm not up and running? And the answer is yes. Just be aware you're gonna have to file another document, pay a couple fees, uh, but you can be the first one in the door and there are a lot of other benefits that come with that. We have to know who you are and of course you gotta pay your filing fee. Okay, um, we don't have time to go through all the <laughs> refusals and stuff, but I want you to be aware uh, that once you do register, there are other things that you're gonna have to do. You're, as long as you have to continue to use your trademark in interstate commerce and file documents with us. And if you do that, your trademark registration can last forever. Literally forever. As long as the United States uh, is still doing federal trademark registration, your trademark registration could be alive. If you think about Coca-Cola, been around for over 100 years, right? It's still there. You too and your business could also have that. Okay, uh, are you guaranteed registration of your trademark? No. Uh, if it registers, do you have to do anything to keep it alive? Yes, okay, cool. Uh, I'm just gonna hit these real quick. Um, for those of you who wanna know more about the process, go ahead and scan the QR code that you see on the screen. If you've been to the booth earlier this week, uh, some of you um, were already forced to scan the QR code off of my phone. Uh, so this is for our Trademark Basics Registration Toolkit. It is a downloadable PDF. I would encourage you to bookmark the link. We um, work on updating the toolkit, so I want you to have the most recent version after we update it, update it. so just don't hang on to that one PDF, okay? So. Uh, Go ahead and download that to your phone. It's, um, try, we try to have it as like, like a primer to try and step you through the process. We get scanned, everybody scanning? You can out. It's also in the Whova app. Okay, it's also in the app. It's also in the app, okay? If you open up the, the Whova app for uh, USPTO, you can, you can get the code there. Um, real quick, um, if you don't mind uh, listening to my crackly voice too much, um, we have our Trademark Basics Bootcamp. It is virtual. It is eight weeks, we run it every single quarter. We take you through everything we talked about today and then we go super in deep on the registration process. You can sign up, we, we run them four times a year. Uh, you can attend, if you can't attend, you're gonna get a link to a recording, all right? So if you wanna know more about the process, um, uh, that's what we do. So you'll see Christina on, on there as well as other people on the team. We take you through the process, like how to search. Okay, we're gonna walk you through the form so you can see how, to act how the form actually works. And we're talking about maybe next year having that be something that we do at MIC. So just saying, just saying, we'll see. Uh, okay, uh, if, you've uh, seen this as well if you came by the booth. If you're not sure if you have a copyright, a patent, a trademark, you can scan that QR code and take a little quiz and find out. Uh, and these are our customer service folks, Trademark Assistance Center. If you have a question that doesn't get answered today, <laughs> you probably will. Um, you can always contact our folks there and they will answer your questions. Again, they cannot give you legal advice. No one at the USPTO can, but they can direct you to resources, which is what we do as, as much as we possibly can. Okay, I got a few All minutes, right. go. I got two minutes, Deepak. Let's go. Mike. Uh, in the way that when we're coming up with our business name, we're able to search with the state to see mm -hmm. if somebody's already using something like that. Do we have the same access to search, hey, is somebody already using this or something pretty close to it before we even get into the, deep into the process? Yes, absolutely. It is, it's free to use. We have um, um, a trademark search system. Uh, the new version of it is coming out right now. It'll be official d December 1st. It's available now for you to use. Uh, but you can check and see, is anybody already, have they already applied for or registered a trademark, which is gonna be similar to mine and used with related goods and services? Okay, always key. Just because someone has registered Dove, that doesn't mean other people can't use the word Dove as a trademark. Same thing is true for you. Okay, if you find somebody else has already registered a trademark, also look to see, are they using it with related goods and services? Okay, yes. Jason, if I have a business name, I have a logo, and I have a slogan, do I, is that three separate applications? 
usually, yes, that's gonna be three separate applications. And the reason I'll say that is because if you think about how you are using your brand name, your slogan, your logo, you're probably not all using them together at once. Sometimes you might use your brand name alone. Sometimes your slogan alone. Sometimes your logo alone. Sometimes you do put them together. But if you register each component separately, you're protecting yourself three different ways and also when they're combined together, okay? You're giving yourself a lot of flexibility. Great question. Uh, sorry, I got the mic in the back. You got to shout. You got to shout. The okay. first time I applied, I uh, received an office action. Yep. And I thought it was just, you turned it down. So I let it go and I had to start up again. Is an office action a bad thing or a good thing in your view? It is, it is uh, either and both, uh, all right? So an office action could be, hey, I'm sorry, uh, this is gonna be a real problem. You can't overcome these things. You always have an opportunity to argue against the refusal. Uh, so sometimes you might consider it a bad thing. Sometimes it's a good thing because the examining attorney says, hey, everything's looking good in your application. We just have to fix this, this, and this. And you say, yeah, I agree to this, this, and this. And the examining attorney says, awesome, cool, good to go. We're going to approve you for pub and get you out the door. Okay? So it depends on the content of the, of the office action. Great question. Yes, go. Similar to copyrights, there's a way that you can kind of do bulk copyrights. Is there anything like that for... For trademarks, you know, kind of like the same business with lots of stuff. No, no, okay. no. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah, but but the thing is, you're going to have to prove to us how you're actually using it, right? So, unless you're using it all bundled up, why would you put that in an application, right? I get it. You want to save on your fees. I get it. No, I get it, right? But if you're not using all of your stuff together, and that's what you want protection for, there's actually more value, even though it might cost you two hundred and fifty more dollars, but you got more flexibility for using trademarks. I know that might not be the answer you're looking for, but that's the answer. What else we got? Oh, one other question back here. Love it. Hit me. So, so let's say I register my trademark and my business is in housewares, but then I decide to move into media. Mm -hmm. Do I get to amend my application with you, or do I have to do another one? How does it work when your business changes? You are asking the greatest questions. I love it. Uh, so uh, the answer is would be a new application. Okay, you cannot amend your current application to include stuff. You, you'd be filing a brand new application to cover the new thing that you're doing. Right? We don't care how many applications you have with us. Okay, Coca-Cola has had a thousand over the years. Right? It's totally fine. You could have fifty. Right? Same trademark, so long as they're all for different goods or services. Right? So love the question because probably your business is going to grow and change. You are going to want to have the ability to be like, yes, I am now an international media conglomerate. I need to protect it for streaming services, right? Or whatever it is. Yes, go. Okay. Forgot this one. Um, so if what is the benefit of going through an attorney to file versus, you know, doing your own search? Say we took that eight-week class. Um, kind of give some insight into working with an attorney versus doing it on your own. Sure. Uh, love the question. So we always recommend you work with a U.S. licensed trademark attorney. That's our recommendation, okay? And that's because the process can be complex. You saw some complexity today, right? You also saw perhaps some simplicity today. And so what we find is 20 to 25% of people do it on their own, but the rest of them work with attorneys. So it's really up to you and your comfort level. If you have time, we got to go. Oh, you have a question back here. OK, okay hold on. Last Give question. Me, well, hold on one second. One second, Deepak. Well, hold on. Uh, so, so the answer is, uh, it's up to you and your comfort level. If you want to put in the time and effort to make yourself comfortable with this stuff, you can absolutely do it on your own. That's one of the reasons that we have boot camp and we, and we go and talk to people is because we want you to feel empowered with the information and the resources that we provide to make your own choices about that. So. It could be that you're like, hey, Jason, I'm running a successful business, okay? I don't have time to mess with your stupid trademark searching. I get it, okay? So it might be you offload that to somebody, it's worth it to you. But there are other people that might make more sense for them to do it on their own. I'll tell you what, when I was examining, there might be an application that would come in the door filed by a person not represented by an attorney, and it would be perfect. The next one comes in the door, and it is trash, okay? And it was filed by an attorney who didn't know what they were doing, okay? So just because it's an attorney, like, look, you wouldn't hire me to represent you, you know, in a criminal case. Okay, Kimberly? Like, don't call me. Don't do it. Next time you're arrested, do not call me. Okay? I cannot help you. Right? But you have a trademark question? I got gotcha, you. Okay? 
So real quick, back here, yes. What's the rule of thumb when one's registered and you see somebody using something similar? Who makes the judgment call as if it's too similar, not similar enough? What if it's a different font than what you use? If you've registered in a, like you show with Coca-Cola, and they did the same thing, you guys use different fonts, but you're in the same realm. Who's right, who's wrong? So there's two separate answers to this, okay? So one would be during the registration process, what's gonna happen is you're already registered, okay? This other guy tr comes in, tries to register something, the examining, I gotta go? Okay, Jordan's cut me off, okay. So the answer is, uh, you would come in the door, and I'm sorry, the other guy comes in, and that means the examining attorney says no to the other person, because you've registered in standard character, it's too close. Out in the real world, it's called trademark infringement, and then it would be up to you and your attorney uh, to figure that out of whether there's um, likelihood of confusion in that case, and then go after that person to get them to stop. So it's gonna be the examining attorney if you're trying to register, and otherwise it's gonna be you and your attorney uh, figuring it out with the other party. Okay, awesome. I wish I could, look, I'm gonna answer more. Yeah, all right, yeah. So, uh, so we have great USPTO with us, uh, folks with us today. There's a whole group of them right back here. We got Christina Calloway. Uh, we're gonna be back at the uh, booth for a little while. If you have more questions that we didn't answer today, uh, we'll try and answer them. Um, so thanks y'all, appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jason, for sharing this critical information and for your insights on the importance of protecting your IP with a federally registered trademark. We're now going to take a five minute break while we set up our panel.
Welcome back to the Veterans Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program. We're ready to begin our panel discussion. The moderator for this panel is Carlos Gutierrez, U.S. Marine Corps veteran and Innovation Outreach Specialist for national programs here at USPTO. Carlos, the floor is yours. Hello and welcome. My name is Carlos Gutierrez, Innovation Outreach Specialist for national programs with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Thank you again for attending this great Veterans Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program. We have a great session for you today. Let me go ahead and get started with introducing our panelists. First, we have Brent Peacock, Director of the Florida Veterans Business Outreach Center. Next, we have our three veterans that we're going to highlight, starting off with Randall Shepard, owner of RSA Labs, Mir Miriam Kazre, founder and CEO of RX Pharmacists, and Matt Standish, author of You Can Smile Too. We'll go ahead and get started with Brent Peacock, who's gonna give us a quick overview of his program. Over to you, Brenton. Thanks, Carlos. The Veterans Business Outreach Center is the SBA's resource for veterans covering the state of Florida. We provide uh, business counseling services. We teach boots to business classes. We've been around since 1999. We're located in Panama City Beach, Florida, hosted by Gulf Coast State College. We've got a great team. We've got a retired SBA lender, Jim Paul. We've got a former corporate trainer and boots to business office manager in Jack Bengio. I'm, of course, I'm a former entrepreneur and the director and grant writer. Keith Roberts is an Army veteran and entrepreneur. He is our budget coordinator and business analyst. We all teach boots to business. And Lisa Haggerty is a former PTAC consultant, business owner, military spouse, and is our government contracting in-house specialist. One thing that's neat about Florida is the state of Florida covers all six military branches. We have Army, Navy, Air Force, Space Force, Marines, Coast Guard, and uh, so we're, we're proud of that. We focus on helping veterans start and grow businesses. We focus highly on the Boost to Business and Boost to Business Reboot programs, but we also do provide business consulting services for veterans of every branch, every era, and at every stage of business development. And we're real happy with that. We work with a couple thousand veterans every year. Everything from questions about starting to buying franchises, being competitive in government contracts, or even selling their businesses. And we hope to continue doing so. Thank you, Brent. We'll go ahead and uh, move on next to hear some uh, of the overviews from everybody. We'll start with Mary Ann. Could you please give us a, a brief overview of your background and your company? Uh, yes. So my name is. Marion Kazray, uh, I am the CEO and founder of RX Pharmacist. And what we do is we um, are the national provider uh, across the United States uh, for pharmacy test prep, specifically for licensure, certifications, and soon CEs. Uh, so we serve um, mainly a smaller niche of pharmacists and our company also has a service component where um, we give back in training programs to support students uh, recent graduates um, in supporting them uh, to get licensed so they can get jobs. Excellent. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, over to you, Randall. Hi, Randall Shepard, founder and CEO of RSA Labs. Uh, I served as a, a pilot, uh, academy professor, and engineer while serving uh, in the Air Force. Um, in uh, eight years ago, we purchased uh, the assets of our former employer, Cubic, um, to form RSA Labs. And RSA Labs basically provides 24 7 global tracking, monitoring, and alerting service using sophisticated global sentinel devices on high value cargo and mobile assets. RSA also owns a proprietary wireless protocol, MIST, mobile interconnected sensor technology for which it sells license rights to entities like the US DOD. I've worked closely over the last eight years with our Veteran Business Outreach Center at Gulf Coast State College uh, in Panama City, Florida, and uh, can give a lot of accolades to, to Brent and his team. Awesome, thanks, Randall. And next, Matt, let's hear a little bit about yourself and uh, your book. Certainly, uh, my name is Matt Standish. I'm a 
retired Force First Sergeant, did 26 years total. And about know, a little over seven years ago, I started jotting down stories from my life, writing them down, uh, figuring out what they are. And after a while, I finally decided, well, why don't I organize this into a, into a, a book and see if I can't publish it and get it out in the hands of the public so they can uh, find some things to smile about. Because the book is titled, You Can Smile Too, and it is almost literally a collection of stories from my life that made me smile. So, but it's been a lot of fun, and uh, uh, Brant and his team did a great job helping me find, you know, exactly how to publish it with resources for setting it up and everything. But uh, I really appreciate them a ton. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, so I can, I can honestly say I am a published author, which is really cool. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, and thank you all for those uh, brief overviews. It's clear that we have uh, three very distinct uh, segments that we're going to get to hear about today. So I'm very excited uh, to hear about uh, your experiences. Uh, and we'll go ahead and get started uh, with uh, the first question, which is, uh, can you do, a, excuse me, can you expand a little bit on your uh, experience with the, the IP journey? Uh, Maryam, let's go ahead and go back to you and, and start with you, if you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so how it started was, you know, creating my small business. Um, I had no idea what to do. So I did what other people sometimes do, which is going out in the community and looking at the resources. So I heard about SCORE. Um, they are one type of resource uh, that is offered. Um, and uh, they are like a volunteer type of organization um, of just successful previous types of business owners to give back and um, help um, newer types of business owners. So reach out to SCORE. Uh, I was very lucky in that I had some great mentors over there. And, um, you know, starting out my business, I had no money. Um, uh, this was a time period in which I, you know, also recently was done with pharmacy school. So I had some student loans. I didn't have any money at that point either. Uh, and some and one of my mentors told me, uh, he said, I don't care if you are, you know, going bankrupt or whatever you're, you're like, you're like type of situation, you must copyright um, all of your content. <laughs> so I, you know, maxed out on credit cards and made sure I copy, I, I copyright all my content to protect it. Um, and uh, that's really how it got started um, of just learning through that process, uh, you know, applying to the USPTO office. And I still do that to this very day of getting the, the like copyrights for whatever content that we make at RX Pharmacist. Excellent. You touched on a lot of things that uh, I, I I have some follow up questions about concerning, uh, you know, resource partners. Obviously, there's Brent that uh, you've worked with, uh, but I do want to hear from everybody on that subject uh, as well. A and there's another point that you touched on there, the copyrights that uh, uh, I want to hear a little bit more about. And I know that Matt uh, has a copyright as well, so definitely want to hear about that. And I know you went through something uh, related to a uh, trademark infringement, so uh let's go ahead and start with that before we even move on because it's it's very interesting and it's an interesting uh um i guess ordeal that i think everybody would like to hear about uh so if you can give us a quick overview and then maybe we'll have some follow-up questions on that uh after everybody else gives their overview but go ahead and uh, uh, give us sure. a give us a primer on that yeah uh so the company name arc services does have a trademark on it um i did apply for that I, I know some people get a little bit hesitant is that they want to hire a lawyer or someone to um, do the application process for them. I would say just have a word of caution because a lot of people um, are out there um, and some are good, but most are bad. So you have to be really, really careful um, when you go to reach out for help to uh, uh, basically tr uh, trademark a name. Um, for my specific story, uh, it was more on copyright infringement. Uh, so what happened was I had a um, major competitor in the market space um, that was a monopoly company. It had almost um, over 98% market share. Um, and as I was growing my company, I got a little bit of market share, about 0.5%. Uh, and um, they felt really threatened about that. Uh, so what they did was they tried to scare me as a new business owner um, out of the marketplace. Um, they sent me cease and desist letters, they um, try to sue me. Uh, and you, and as you can imagine, as a, as a new business owner, right, you know, um, uh, I, I was 
really stressed out. Uh, you know, I had no idea what, what, what's going on, what to do. And I had to go through a bunch of different lawyers to try to get some help on that. Um, and keep in mind at this time, I already copyrighted all my content. So like I said, that in the beginning, right, from SCORE, um, that, that, that one mentor um, that mentioned to me and said, hey, make sure you copyright yourself in the very beginning. Um, and, and I did. Uh, so, so long story short, um, it, did, it did take about a year to go through. Um, but uh, I ended up uh, winning. It was a frivolous lawsuit case, um, mainly because, um, believe it or not, uh, this multi-million dollar company did not copyright their content. <laughs> so it was crazy how when we searched on the copyright, we said, wow, they they didn't even copyright their own content. And um, when we went through what they were claiming, it was really frivolous. They were just trying to scare me out of the marketplace. Um, and what pushed me to continue and not give up um, was the mission. Of my company. Um, we are here to serve students. We are here to give back and really help people get back on their feet, get full time employment jobs um, and really helping society out. Uh, pharmacists are free, right? You can go to CVS, Walgreens or your any any type of um, you know stores and you can ask a pharmacist for help. Uh, it's free and they're the most accessible healthcare provider um, that we have. You know, you don't have to go wait, you know, and call up to, to like make an appointment with your doctor or like nurse. Um, so we do play a really valuable role in um, society for that. So that's where it really kept me pushing and going. Um, another was, um, like I said, I, I at this time frame, um, you know, I just graduated school. I had some loans. I wasn't really making much money. So when they were trying to scare me and say, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll sue you too. I'm like, bring it on. I have nothing to lose. Like, I, I don't own any assets. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm really poor right now. And, and, you know, quite frankly, I don't have anything. So, you know, um, you know, you're more than welcome till I do that too. So anyways, uh, yeah, they were just trying to scare me. So with a lot of business owners, um, you know, please don't be afraid, get the help that you need, reach out for help, you know, and I had no idea, but, um, I, I heard from, uh, from, uh, from my this forum that you could also reach out to USPTO for, uh, help as well. Definitely, uh, and that's uh, it's unfortunate that you had to go through that, uh, but I'm sure you have a lot of lessons learned that I that I would li like to hear a little bit more about uh, after we hear from the uh, the other panelists. And there are offices at USPTO that provide resources. Uh, the one in particular that comes to mind is the uh, Patent Pro Se program, uh, and I'll go over that a little bit uh, here at the end of the session. Uh, well, that's a good lead in as well to uh, turning it over to Randall. I know he dealt with something. Uh, similar, but not the same, but as it applies to patents. Uh, so, Randall, uh, you want to tell us a little bit about your IP journey and your experience? Sure. I feel like a little bit of an IP, uh, IP war horse here, having been a, a serial entrepreneur for 36 years and, you know, kind of working through the trials and tribulations. Um, our first patent attempt was, was not successful. We spent a lot of money, but it just could not overcome the, uh, the, the the perception of, of uh, prior art. And so it, it kind of made us cautious going forward on, on what to patent or what to try to patent. So uh, we took on more of a, a philosophy or a policy of, of trade secret. And um, trade secrets are okay, uh, but uh, you really need to document them internally. Um, and you really need to be diligent about non-disclosure agreements and, and not let that information get out into the uh, public domain because it's, you know, it's, it's no longer, no longer trade secret. So it does take a, a special discipline, but, um, it did help us in, in thwarting off some, uh, patent trolls, uh, you know, patent trolls are responsible for about 85% of the, uh, uh, lawsuits in the technical market, and uh, it's tough. So one of the things I actually did when I purchased uh, the assets back from Cubic for to form RSA Labs was got a an industry expert to do a do a survey. Uh, this person actually uh, was an expert in warding off uh, patent trolls in the IoT and and uh, telecommunications industry. So uh, we had him look at uh, at our technology and uh, see if we were stepping on anybody's uh, anybody's landmines. Um, it was surprising. Well, number one, we didn't think we were, but what was surprising was he found that some people were were stepping on ours. And so then you come to a decision. Okay, you have have people that are stepping on your your intellectual property, including some of our patents. Uh, what do you do? 
Well, this particular company happened to be a Fortune 100 company. And, um, you know, we were counseled that, you know, it's really a hornet's nest and, and there's a good chance they have a, a very extensive patent portfolio that they'll, they'll obviously claim um, that, uh, you know, you are violating something. So um, we've taken on um, a more of a, a philosophy now of we, we have done a number of patents. I think we have 34 total, I think 15, 16 are, are US and the others are, are foreign. Um, they are expensive and there is a, is a maintenance fee, but uh, these were, were patents that were required because we were licensing our technology and and putting it out there in the public domain for for licensing so so felt that was critical uh one short story about uh trade trademarks um usually we we found it was uh, pretty easy to to do our own own trademark filing and and have done that a number of times unfortunately um when we purchased the assets from cubic um all the Trademarks did not get transferred uh, when we, uh, and unfortunately it was about a couple months down later, we went back to really look and do an audit and found that our one of our main trademarks, Global Sentinel, um, was abandoned by Cubic and not transferred. So we had to do another application and um, we got on the tr on the radar screen of, a, of another Fortune 100 company who uh, used uh, Sentinel as part of their product line. And so we were um, in a position of of changing uh, the coverage of our our global sentinels. And even though we do a lot of tracking of vehicles and trucks and and cars, uh, we were um, encouraged to take that out of our coverage area. And so you know it, it's one of those things you kind of have to look at the at the uh, at the battles you pick, but. Um, uh, patent defense can uh, can be expensive, and and you got to pick your battles. Sure. No, thanks for that story, uh, Randall. And I think you touched on something very important, and you and Miriam both touched on something that I think it's important to highlight, which is that uh, in in some cases there may be you know a need to engage with other companies and get into uh, you know litigation or or uh, you know. Uh, figure things out from a legal perspective. So uh, I think that's valuable for everybody to know that the process with intellectual property doesn't end with, you know, the application and the approval that may in some cases be uh, just the beginning. So uh, thank you for highlighting that. And I'm, I'm going to definitely have some follow up questions for you as well. Um, so next, Matt, let's hear about your book. Sure. Well, my process was not nearly as complicated as, as everybody else. Um, I just, you know, I just started writing everything down and probably the most, the difficult thing about it was, was coordinating because I got a lot of pictures in there and finding pictures that didn't show people's faces or if they did, tracking those people down to get their permission to add that picture to the book. Um, what I ultimately did, cause I didn't want to, I didn't have money to pay somebody to, to develop it or anything like that. I went through a process uh, through Amazon called Kindle Direct Publishing. Uh, they make it very, very simple. Uh, you basically, if you do all the work, putting the book together, formatting, setting up your covers, they provided loads of templates to help you do it. Um, once you put it all together, you basically upload it. They look it over if it's good, assign a price to it, and bam, it's up for sale on Amazon with a an ISBN number assigned to it and copyright already done. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was pretty, in, a pretty easy process. Um, they did offer a lot of services that I just wasn't willing to pay for. I mean, my wife was my editor and she did a great job. She highlighted all kinds of mistakes in there, but, uh, it was just, it was a lot of fun to do. Uh, and I can pretty much literally say, I, I pretty much did it all myself. From the covers to the words to the layout in a paperback and an electronic version. And thinking about doing an audio version, but it's hard to see pictures in an audiobook. So I'm not sure if I want to go that route. But uh it's it was a little challenging, but uh you know, now that it's out there, I know whatever happens to me, I do have a legacy to leave behind that it will always be there. So oh, sure, for sure. And also, Matt, could you could you just give everybody a quick overview about what the what the book's about? Oh, sure. Well, 
basically, uh, well, I was, a, I was a first sergeant in the Air Force. Uh, and I loved being a first sergeant, you know, because first sergeants is all about people, uh, helping people with their problems, guiding them. And my philosophy as a first sergeant was basically was uh, preventive discipline, which meant get out of the office, go see my troops, get to know them, uh, try to keep them motivated, work on morale. And so when I left the Air Force, uh, I couldn't really use that philosophy anymore because I didn't have any people assigned to me. So I shifted it to, I, I basically started making it my daily goal to make every person I meet smile. And when I started working on the book, I just started collecting, just writing down stories from my life, stories that made me smile. Uh, if you go in there, there's a whole big chapter about my trip to Iraq in 2005 where uh, I really had the best time of my entire career. You know, first, because I was Air Force. Uh, but for me as a first sergeant, it was almost paradise because none of my people could leave the base. No alcohol, no husbands and wives there together. 90% of my problems are gone. So for me, the whole time was about morale. So every day was spent finding ways to have fun. So my trip to Iraq has a huge chapter. I have a special needs son that I'm really proud of. He has his own chapter. My dog has a chapter. My Harley, which you can see behind me, this got a chapter in the book. All these things that made me smile. And the whole goal is that hopefully somebody can pick it up, read it, and find something to smile about. So maybe it's my little effort to change the world a little bit for the better. But it, it's really, it was fun, and I'm really proud of it. Excellent. Thank you for that overview, Matt. And it sounds like a good read. And I will say, uh, you might want to definitely look into that audiobooks. I do all my my uh, my reading on on uh, audiobooks these days, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. Uh, so I, I, I want to go back and we'll go ahead and uh, mix it up a little bit here and start with uh, Randall on this one. I, I want to ask uh, if you want to go ahead and I know you gave one story already, but if you wanted to expand on uh, some of the challenges, I know you got into it a little bit, but I think that, uh, you know, uh, the the audience, I feel, gets a lot out of hearing direct about direct experiences, whether that's one thing or, or a, a number of things. Uh, and also in conjunction with that, uh, you know, if there's anything that was surprising to you along the way, things that, you know, kind of came as a shock uh, that you really didn't expect. Uh, so if you can go ahead and address maybe those two and then we'll we'll go over to Miriam uh, for the same. Sure. Well, maybe I'll, I'll talk about the, the last patent we had had awarded and that was actually um, um, during COVID. Um, we were approached by uh, IBM for a social distance monitoring technology. Uh, we looked at our current MIST uh, IoT protocol and, and Bluetooth and the other technologies that were being used and saw they weren't very effective. And so we pivoted and, and took one of our sensors we use on our, on our global sentinel and our tracking monitoring devices, uh, an ultrasonic sensor and turned it into what's called a transponder. So it could very accurately de determine the distance between two devices. And so by putting those on people, we were able to create a very accurate uh, six foot distance monitor and we called it uh, range aware. Um, we applied for a patent for that uh, and we took the approach of engaging a, um, a patent technician to begin with because there was a number of diagrams and they're much more cost effective than a patent, patent lawyer uh, to get your first cut at and get the basics down and particularly get your figures um, uh, coordinated and, and uh, in a proper format uh, even before we engaged uh, the patent patent lawyer. And as a result, um, we did uh, very few iterations on that as compared to some of our other patent attempts. And um, actually when it, uh, when it went through, there was uh, minimal uh, office action. And because that patent was uh, COVID related, uh, it was accelerated. And I believe we got that patent award in, in less than one year. That is, uh, really, really pretty phenomenal. Um, we've since pivoted that technology since uh, social distance monitoring is not as, as much of a, an issue now, but applying that to um, human interaction to um, 
mobile equipment and robots and robotics because uh, you know those robots need to know that that object they're approaching is uh, is a non-deterministic moving human and and not a filing cabinet. And so uh, again, it's a it's a case where the application initially uh, isn't the ultimate application. But after you have credit to the US uh, PTO for um, encouraging technology innovation during COVID and accelerating those patents. Definitely, thank you for that uh, that overview. Uh, I, I, I wanted to, to say, I, th I think you touched on something very important there. It's a great takeaway, uh, the use of the patent technician to minimize office actions and expedite the process. You know, we get a lot of questions about, you know, how can we, expedite this process and there is a program at USPTO uh there's char there's a charge for it but for uh, expediting but also uh it was mentioned earlier uh the patent pro se program which serves in a in a similar capacity i wouldn't say the exact same but uh you know you're able to engage with attorneys at USPTO to kind of look at things that may need to to happen early in the process that may be able to speed things up uh so it's a great takeaway there uh, Miriam, same same over to you. Uh, challenges that you wanted to expand on, or uh, also surprises? Uh, sure. So I think uh, one thing that might be relevant in our day and age uh, is the rapid increase of AI usage, specifically generative AI. Uh, so um, as I'm, you know, as as our company continuously creates content and we use humans to create content, uh, we don't uh, we we started you know stay away from AI and, and all that stuff. Uh, the importance of that is because if you want to copyright your content, I know there is some discussions uh, going on between USPTO and other types of organizations on what would qualify right of being able to copyright content um, that you know potentially has been created by an an. AI system or a Gen AI type of system. Uh, so it's one thing that I, I kind of bring up, um, even with you know my team. You know we were thinking, gosh, should we use AI? Like it could potentially help us, but I don't think we're there yet. I, I think the quality of the content is still very high when it's um, done by a human, at least for us, because we deal with the complex laws and legalities when it affects pharmacists and pharmacy across um, you know the 22 plus states that we that we basically cover. Uh, and in addition to that, as you're looking at, you know, uh, you know, for example, uh, Amazon KDP, uh, you know, someone else mentioned that too, um, when you want to upload and, and publish something on there, they actually ask you twice, not once, twice, um, have you used AI for this? Um, because they're also starting to track of, um, of that as well. So when it say it's a challenge per se, but it may be a challenge for others that are using Gen AI or AI um, in their content creation or product creation as well. Definitely. Yeah, thank you for that. And there are, I feel like a lot of fast moving developments in AI. Uh, it feels like kind of uh, the, the process of innovation uh, being applied in real time when you see things that are just outdated, you know, from week to week uh, as things get updated, not only uh, with usage in the market, but also with, uh, uh, I think you mentioned it, uh, policies uh, around AI and things that have to deal with uh, legislation. So uh, I'm certainly no expert, I think, but I think it's uh, something that we all should uh, keep an eye on. Uh, Matt, how about you? Any uh, challenges along the way or any other things uh, uh, other than not having to worry about people causing trouble on the base <laughs> uh, and also anything that, that came as a surprise? Well, probably one of the hardest things to do was to find a title for the book that wasn't already being used somewhere. Sure. Uh, um, I searched several different combinations, a lot of, you know, internet searching to see, you know, what, what didn't, what was already being used and came up with this one. And it just, you can smile too, was just really, really turned out to be just right. Because that's what I'm trying to do is give people things to smile about. Um, other than that, you know, just, you know, finding the people in the pictures to get their permission to use their photos. And, um, I don't know. And the Amazon, uh, Kindle Direct Publishing actually makes things pretty easy. Um, other than that, it was just edit, 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 edit to make sure everything was right and get all the mistakes out of it. But, uh, sure. Kindle Direct Publishing made the process pretty simple. 
Great. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that recommendation for Kindred. I'm actually going to look that one up myself. I'm working on a couple of things uh, with some partners. So that's a, that's a great recommend right there. Uh, lastly, uh, I know we could probably talk about these things all day, but I, uh, I want to keep us under, under time. Uh, I, with the, with the exit, I want to go back around and ask everybody, uh, what are some pieces of advice, recommendations, best practices that you would uh, like to share with anybody that's going through maybe a similar experience or working in your segment or working on things that you've uh, had some experience with? And and we'll just go back around, and but we'll go ahead and start with you this time, Matt. Uh, any of those recommendations that you can provide to somebody that's uh, looking to, to write a book or looking to start the process? Well, it, it takes time. You got to work at it and and just you know keep writing, keep editing. The editing process is probably the hardest part because you got to go back in and correct all the mistakes and then involve as many people as you can because your eyes don't catch everything and you got to have other people looking at it to to find the mistakes and and help you get it right. Um, biggest advice is if you want to do it, it can be done. So, you know, live your dreams and go out and do it. Um, because I, I'm a published author now, I also write for a local magazine here on here in Panama City. Uh, it's a, a little magazine on the beach, and I do an article every month that features a Panama City Beach veteran. Uh, I do a lot of public speaking now. I've spoken to, you know, to all the Rotary Clubs, Kiwanis Clubs. Uh, I get on, on base. I've talked to squadrons. And just to give a, anywhere from a five to 20, 30 minute motivational presentation, just to try to inspire people and get them to, to help spread the smiles around the world, what I wanna to try to do. Excellent. Thanks for sharing, Matt, appreciate it. Um, next, we'll go over to Mary Ann. Also, I wanted to mention, cause I know you, Mary Ann, you and Randall had mentioned uh, working with other resource partners. Obviously, we have the great uh, Brent Peacock here, who I've been working with uh, for many years and who's, does great work and does great job there in, in Florida. But I know there's other ones. Miriam, you mentioned uh, SCORE, but as part of this, you know, recommendations, if either one of you uh, have recommendations for uh, resource providers, technical assistance providers out there in the community, we'd also love to hear about that as well. So uh, take it away, Miriam. All right. Sounds good. Um. I am sure there's a ton of resources. It's just people don't know what they don't know. So I highly recommend go on Google, wherever you're at, uh, and just basically search for it. Um, you'll be surprised. You'll find a lot of different resources in your local and state governments, as well as on the national level, um, and also getting networked in and talking to people. Uh, you know, reach out to other types of folks that is doing something similar to you. Uh, LinkedIn is also really powerful. Uh, and you'd be surprised if you send them a quick message. Uh, I mean, especially if you're working on small business or things like this, um, you'll be surprised, uh, you know, how how much people want to give back and to help. But it's not going to help if you don't ask. So uh, please ask for help. I know, especially within the veteran community, uh, it's hard for us to ask. We're not the type of people to ask. Uh, so um, definitely. Make sure to ask for help uh, and then also um, plan things out, you know, uh, really think about, OK, if I'm going to be doing this, um, what is my, you know, short term plan and long term plan? And if you fail at something, it's OK. Uh, failing is a great process. You know, I failed when I got those scary cease and desist letters and lawsuits, um, but it was a great learning experience. Oh, my goodness. I learned so much from that. Um, yes, it was stressful. Uh, yes, I was sometimes crying at night because I, I didn't know what to do. And I, I, I felt so lonely that I, I didn't know who to get help from. Um, but luckily I found people that were willing to help me out. And um, also uh, I learned so much from that experience too. So uh, it's definitely a journey. Uh, don't be scared of it. Uh, and instead uh, focus on your mission, um, whatever that mission is that you want to accomplish. Um, that is what's going to help you um, push through and get to the finish line and also cross the finish line as well. Excellent. Thank you, Miriam, for those great recommendations. Uh, Randall. So maybe a little advice on, on trademarks, you know, tr trademarks are, are really key um, to identifying and, and having, having uh, unique discriminators for your, for your company. 
but before you um, start to put some names to things, do a little research, see who's using it. And just because somebody else has uh, that particular name trademark does not mean that you cannot use it. Go in and look at what domain they're in. If they're not overlapping in, in your domain, then you you can have a right to to file that. And that's that, uh, quite frankly, is a, a lot of what happens in the trademarks as to how how broad you can claim your your area of use. But um, you know, get it out there in use because with the, with that uh, TM superscript, because that'll that'll start to establish uh, the fact that you're you're using it in practice, and then uh, keep an eye out for those that that might be uh, violating. And again, look at uh, how they're using it and and in context. But um, you know, trademarks are are valuable and and uh, in fact, you know, can can really uh, carry carry your brand forward and in, in the market. Excellent, thank you, Randall, and thank you again, uh, Matt and Miriam. Uh, a big thanks from USPTO, and I also want to say uh, it looks like Brent must have got disconnected there, but a special thanks to Brent uh, for helping to facilitate this. I know. Uh, you all were involved with his his office and his program, so we really appreciate the work that he does and uh, the fact that he uh, was able to talk to all of you and get you to participate in this in this program. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, I'm going to give a quick overview of resources, but I appreciate all of your time and have a good day. And we'll go ahead and start with the resource presentation. So resources were mentioned a couple of times by our panelists there and USPTO of course has uh, resources as well for independent inventors, small business owners and entrepreneurs. Uh, the great place to start is USPTO.gov. You can look at patent basics and patent trademarks. There's trainings and education events, just a whole lot of uh, information, uh, recorded sessions, uh, things like that. Also, there's these categories of resources that are available at USPTO's resource hub uh, for innovators and inventors, uh, things like entrepreneurship resources, how to get started, things that you should do before you apply, and how to protect yourself. There's the uh, website down below, uspto.gov slash inventors. Uh, next, USPTO has a network of patent and trademark resource centers, uh, PTRCs, uh, is the acronym, and basically these are a network of resources that are designed by the USPTO to disseminate patent and trademark information. So if you have questions and you're looking for somebody local, this is a great place to start. Another great place to start is looking at which regional office covers your area. USPTO has five regional offices, one in Silicon Valley, California, Denver, Colorado, Detroit, Michigan, Dallas, Texas, and the one for the regional, excuse me, for the Eastern region is co-located with headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. You can find out more information about those at USPTO.gov slash locations. These offices put on their own events throughout their regions as well. Uh, they have staff that are uh, patent and trademark experts, so feel free to reach out to them as well. Additionally, if you want assistance with patent and or trademarks specifically, these are the, uh, the contact information for each of those. You got phone numbers here, you got their website, you can send them uh, an email and you can pose those questions directly to these, to these offices. Additionally, there's a couple of programs for legal assistance. There's the patent pro bono program, which is a nationwide program for matching financially under-resourced inventors with some resources. Uh, there are income thresholds for that program, which you can find out more about at uspto.gov slash pro bono, uh, and, or, and or you can email them at pro bono at uspto.gov. It's also a great law school uh, clinic certification program that allows law students under the supervision of a participating law school clinic supervisor to practice patent and trademark law uh, before the USPTO uh, while they're serving, excuse me, while they're providing those resources uh, to applicants pro bono. Uh, and here's their contact information as well. 
Another great program, which I mentioned a couple of times, is the Patent Pro Se program for those that are filing patent applications uh, on their own, whether throughout the process or just initially, without the assistance of a registered patent attorney or agent. And you can find out more about that program at uspto.gov slash pro se patents. Uh, another thing that would help stay current with anything that's going on at USPTO is to be able to uh, subscribe to the alerts. Great information there on updates maybe to legislation or some new regulations associated uh, with intellectual property. Uh, and those can be, and you can subscribe to that at usepto.gov slash subscribe. This event is part of a series of events for affinity groups. You'll see here the other affinity groups which have similar programs and a national program that we put on every year called Invention Con, uh, which is a three-day conference for independent inventors. There's also Hispanic Innovation and Entrepreneurship events, Black Innovation and Entrepreneurship, Asian American, and Women's Entrepreneurship Symposiums. The women's programs are currently being offered every month. Uh, all of these as well are recorded and can be viewed at the USPTO YouTube channel. Uh, for more information, go to uspto.gov slash innovation for all. This is another element of the alerts as well. You might want to stay, stay abreast of uh, all of the events that are going on. You can go to uspto.gov slash events and look at all the events either locally or virtually. Uh, they'll have things that are going on at headquarters and things that are going on at the, the regional offices as well. We want to thank everyone who joined us today, especially those who served in our armed forces and their family members. If you enjoyed today's program, be sure to log on to our events page and check out our upcoming programs at www.uspto.gov slash events. Thank you again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at our future programs. Have a good day.